the streets, uh, less traffic, less people walking around. So um, it is a, a different, there's no anarchy and chaos, uh, as the president said in the, uh, uh, in the presidential election, uh, if they could be called so, and um, there's also not a deserted town. So it's quite a, something different, but still the situation for everyone involved in the arts and theater and performance uh, is uh, so, so difficult, so dangerous, and we do not know where it will go. And when at the end of the year, uh, unemployment uh, support will run out, um, what will happen? But not only it's about, as we say, financial, economical things, what the state of the art is all about, but also we really do question us. What are we doing? Where do we come from? Where are we going? And uh, for four months, Siegel Center Hold talks every day with artists from around the world. Um, if you want to check on some of the excerpts, uh, PAJ Performing Arts Journal just published uh, with MIT Press, I think quite an uh, impressive uh, array of excerpts from 30 artists, a big undertaking. Bonnie Moranka and uh, Bill Gillespie went through, uh, Ben Gillespie went through. So um, now we are opening up to uh, people who, in my view, also artists are, in the sense of Joseph Boyce, enlarged uh, idea of an artwork. They are curators, they are presenters, they are producers, but also thinkers, academics, philosophers. And um, with us today, we have an important voice, an important uh, uh, producing artists, uh, curating artists uh, uh, in the landscape of New York City uh, and uh, uh, with us here and someone who is influential but also successful but in the right way and there's a lot uh, we can learn from him. We have with us today Gideon Lester who is the artistic director of the Fisher Center at Bard. Later on Tanya Kuri, uh, his collaborator, will uh, join us. She's in Beirut at the moment and she is a uh, an artist in a residence of theater and performance and the co-director of an MA in human rights and the arts at Bard College. And we will talk about this, which is an interesting and important and I think significant initiative. For all of those of you who do not know about Gideon and we also have many international listeners, he is the director, as I said, artistic director of the Fisher Center at Bard. He's a creative producer and dramaturg. He has collaborated with and commissioned leading international and American artists across disciplines, including Romeo Castellucci, Justin Vivian Bond, uh, Sarah Mitchelson, Nature Feet of Oklahoma, Claudia Ronquin, uh, Anna Dever Smith. And recent uh, works include Where No Wall Remains, an international festival on Boros, which he did with Tanya, who later will uh, join us, Daniel Fish, Oklahoma. And for all of those who do not know, it did get a Tony Award. It's just that rare thing, uh, something crossed over like uh, the hair production in a way uh, uh, did, or the, um, the Hamilton in some way. Um, he did uh, Ashley uh, Tada's Mad Forest, which we talked about here on Siegel Talks. We had a session with her and also he didn't encourage us to have her, have her on here. There was, a, I think, a brilliant work and one of the significant works uh, uh, of, of this time. And um, Peter Sellers' upcoming, this body is so impermanent. So he founded and directs Live Arts BART, the Fisher Center Residency and Commissioning Program. It's quite unique. And he also chairs, uh, and I don't think it's a side job. For normally people, that's a full-time job. He chairs the uh, Undergraduate Theater and Performance Program at BART College. He worked with uh, everyone at Crossing the Line Festival, the great festival uh, that came out of El Piaf and uh, one collaboration. And uh, he was the acting artistic director of ART Theatre, the great um, ART, where many think maybe uh, he should have gone there and uh, taken on the helm uh, looking at, at the work you do know. So Gideon, sorry for the long introduction. Siegel Talks is all about listening, as I always, and then I talk and talk. I hope you forgive me. So uh, Gideon, um, uh, how are you in, in these days? Uh, I, you know, given the state of the world, um, I would say that I am doing pretty well. First, Frank, I just want to say thank you for the invitation and really thank you on you know, behalf of the whole community for the incredible work you've been doing since March because you've been providing us with a lifeline and a window into what extraordinary artists all over the world have been doing. So this archive you're building is um, necessary and really magnificent and, and uh, as I was saying to you earlier, you know, some of the projects that we're working on now have come directly out of Siegel Talks. So I hope, I hope we can talk about that. Anyway, I'm doing fine. Uh, I, have, I have nothing to complain about. I'm working with really interesting artists on some great projects and uh, that 
keeps me going in dark times. Yeah, so um, I know you were in the middle of productions, right? Ashley uh, talked about it, you know, when it happened, you were in full speed, uh, the semester, and still in the beginning in a way. Um, what, what how, how did it happen and um, how did you all react to it and what would change in your work? You're, you're, uh, you're talking about Mad Forest, the, yeah. the, the, general, the production yeah. that I actually directed. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it happened because, um, well, so, so for, for, for anyone watching who doesn't know about the project, this was a, a production of Mad Forest, Carol Churchill's play about the Romanian revolution um, that Ashley Tater was directing with our students aboard. Um, and uh, on March 13th or 14th, when it became clear that we weren't gonna be able to carry on in person, um, I called Ashley and said, you know, we have two choices. One is just to cancel the project and the other is to find some way to keep going, um, having no idea what that might be. And um, she said, yes, we have to keep going. And um, she uh, spoke with her collaborators um, and uh, uh, spoke to Eamon Farrell, a very brilliant uh, video designer and director who, um, she's worked with before, who said, a student of mine um, happens to be a Zoom coder, he's developing a new platform that uh, may be helpful for you. And uh, so we moved the production online. The, the production staff at the Fisher Center, who are totally magnificent, um, reinvented themselves in about two days as a digital production center. We set up remote studios for um, all the students who had gone off um, to their respective homes all over the country. Um, so we set up, um, you know, green, we sent them green screens and lighting and their costumes and so on. And uh, we made a film. And, you know, although it was an extreme change, certainly none of us, when uh, Ashley first proposed Matt Forrest, had any idea that this would go online. Um, it's not so unlike many of the projects that we work on. I mean, I would say we, when, when, a, when a project is really cooking or when an idea is right, we actually have no idea what the outcome is gonna be because we're going on a long, long journey together. Um, the institution uh, with the artists, um, the artists are really leading. And I think that that's the key thing here is that, um, you know, the, uh, the only thing that we do right is to put artists right at the center of the process and do everything we possibly can to open up um, artists' dreams and to support them as best we can and to reimagine our infrastructure all the time uh, so that we're never doing the same thing twice. There's no cookie cutter approach. There's no duplication. Mm -hmm. We're really focusing um, all of our resources uh, on what a particular artist and a particular project needs. And in this instance, what, what was needed was a, um, a reinvention of how we produce to be online. And we're continuing doing that. And I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, there are stories that Peter Brook tells in The Empty Space uh, about theatre during the Second World War. And he tells a story about um, coming across a, a bombed out theatre in, I think, Hamburg and going in and seeing one of the most electrifying performances of his life that um, a group of performers had just put up uh, because they felt a deep necessity to perform. And I keep thinking about that analogy, you know, of the burnt out theater. And right now we can't be in theaters, but for me, this does not mean we shouldn't be producing. Um, in fact, I think in very dark times, we really have an obligation to produce because art is essential. And we can't say, uh, you know, because the world is so screwed up in so many ways, we're gonna stop prioritizing the creation of art. Actually, we need artists more than ever at the moment to help get us through. So um, that's a very long answer to, um, to your question, but just to say, you know, there is no business as usual for us, except that business as usual is supporting artists and that's what we're continuing to do.
did something change? I mean, with the metaphors or in general with the COVID, do you feel something on your internal hard drive moved? Is an update or do you think no, it reinforces what we what we already knew and now? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, in a way, I'm in a very privileged position. You know, I, I, um, I work for a, a really pioneering institution, Bard College, which has um, long, long been in the forefront of, um, you know, putting the arts at the center of everything. Um, we never have to apologize for art um, at Bard, and I, I am very grateful for that. Uh, because I know what it's like to be in institutions where that's not the case. Um, so, and we, we are not in the position that, you know, say a large opera house is where we have very large fixed costs. So we haven't had to furlough anybody. Um, and, uh, you know, our budgets are fairly small, but we, we raise the money that we need to produce what we're producing. Um, I, so in a sense, I feel actually some freedom at the moment because um, we're really having to imagine how to reach audiences and uh, develop work in new ways. So it's a very rare opportunity to think about new infrastructures. And I'll give you an example. Um, and this came straight out of uh, a sequel talk. Um, you had Peter Sellers uh, on uh, in, I think early April, mm -hmm. very soon after um, Mad Forest had happened. And Peter was talking um, in your conversation about this project that he was working on, which is a, an adaptation of a segment of the Vimalakirti Sutra, first century Buddhist Sutra. And he wasn't able to continue with it because it was uh, initially conceived to be performed in art museums and you know the art museums are closed. So I saw the talk and um, I called him and said, you know, I don't know if this is ever useful to you, but we, we have started to develop a new digital platform. And if ever it's interesting to you to imagine a virtual rendition of the Sutra, um, we're here for you. And, you know, Peter is Peter and his imagination expands <laughs> in these cosmic ways. And within five minutes, he said, actually, um, cyberspace is the right place for a sutra because um, the, the part of the subject of Buddhist teaching is our relationship with the infinite. And the internet is the infinite and we can be in many dimensions at the same time. So, you know, I don't know what form this is gonna take, but yes, let's do it. So we started working and um, he's collaborating with, um, uh, Michael Schumacher, a dancer in um, Amsterdam, and uh, Ganavia Doraswamy, a South Indian singer who's currently in Portland, Oregon, and Wang Dongling, a very, very fine um, Chinese calligrapher um, who is in Hangzhou, and also with a, um, a, a, an eminent Hong Kong cinematographer, Yulikwai, and they're rehearsing on Zoom. And uh, they've now uh, invented really a new form, a kind of digital film that they're making remotely. Um, and we're gonna be working with cultural partners and hospitals and um, wellness institutions because the subject you may remember from Peter's talk is really about the wisdom that can come from sickness, the wisdom that can come from a, from a pandemic. And early in the new year, this is gonna go global and it's gonna be offered as a gift to audiences all over the world. Now, none of us in April or March had any idea that this was gonna be how we were spending our time, but the project uh, and the artists, but really I think in some way the project, the essence of the project tells us what needs to be done. And then we figure out how we're gonna do it. So the, um, the creative problem solving and the flexible thinking uh, needed to uh, support this kind of work don't stop with the pandemic. Um, and actually, uh, when we can't get into the building, we do have some opportunities to um, work with artists to imagine new forms of production and new forms of reaching audiences which are you know, probably not here forever. And they're not a, no one's pretending that this is a substitute 
for live performance, but, you know, boy, is it interesting to be making work when the world is on fire, interesting and essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, really, it really, it really is like that old uh, Japanese haiku, when your roof is broken, you see the moon, right? Uh, and um, with all the complication uh, <laughs> that it has. Um, a, a question, Gideon, you are also at a university like we are, and everybody, of course, thinks what is the meaning of what we do. There are universities, Keller Arts, uh, uh, as a presenter and also teaching university. Uh, there is a, a Skirball as a presenter, Jay and uh, Montclair. Um, but most probably the Bart Center in a way is leading uh, in its whole thing, uh, in a holistic way, what is putting up and took over perhaps a spot that under Brustein ART had, you know, ART that perhaps has lost a bit its way, that even, you know, the accusations now that we, we do here, even on, you know, institutional racism or come not listening, you know, there is the great TDM initiative that I think is bringing a light uh, into campus there. But um, what do you think uh, 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 it, your, as your vision, what place does theater performance has at a university? It's a great question. Um, I would say that uh, my vision is changing very rapidly at the moment. Um, because uh, our truly magnificent students at Bard um, have become um, very, very active in the Black Lives Matter movement and are questioning everything that we're doing and working with us in very collaborative ways to reimagine the future. And, you know, we all grew up, I mean, you talk about ART under Brewstein, which was my school and my home for many years. Um, and you're right, it produced some of the greatest work in the country. Um, but what we didn't understand then, uh, for me in the 1990s, was that this is a really patriarchal institution. I didn't understand it because I was in the middle of it. Um, but, you know, this was a model in which we had, you know, uh, one artistic director um, who was a white guy um, making all of the artistic decisions and then the institution um, was there at the service of those ideas you know and um, uh, I have only admiration for Bob who was really a mentor to me um, but this was very much a system of its time mm -hmm. and what our students are saying to us now is let's imagine other structures which are not top-down where decisions are made much more laterally, um, where you're inviting other people into the conversations uh, and where we can learn as much from a 19 year old as we can from a 48 year old. And I'm very, very excited about where this is going to take us. And it's work that we'd already begun to do at Bard. I mean, I, I uh, wherever possible, um, you know, bring in, uh, guest curators and colleagues to um, shape the program. Uh, my closest partner at Bard is Caleb Hammond, so I hope uh, one day you'll have um, uh, for a Siegel talk as well. Sure. Um, he was a prelude curator. You know, that's exactly right. He was a prelude oh. curator. He was a curator with Push. Um, mm -hmm. He worked at Soho Rep. Um, he was a founding administrator with 13P. Um, he was really responsible for the incredible life and times Nature Theatre of Oklahoma cycle at the public. Um, and Caleb is increasingly taking a, a programming hand, but we've, you know, we had five years of Justin Vivian Bond curating and programming and hosting our Spiegel tent and creating um, uh, a brilliant alternative, highly political space there. Um, and then, you know, Tanya Okuri, who will be joined within a few minutes, um, uh, curated with us a festival uh, this time last year on the subject of borders. And I don't think it's interesting for one person to be making um, all the decisions all the time. Um, but you asked about the relationship between, um, you know, a theater center, an art center and a university. And I would say that the vision um, for what we're, what we have tried to make, and I think what we're gonna continue to try to make at the Fisher Center is very 
influenced by Bauhaus and Black Mountain um, and Black Mountain College and Bard had a lot of um, a lot of crossover. Um, the idea that um, if you have students and professional artists and faculty and audiences all in the building together, that there has to be deep cross fertilization um, and cross pollination. And again, this idea that you know professional artists um, should be learning as much from students as students are learning from from professional artists. So we, when I got there, um, there was a there was quite a separation between um, the academic programs in the Fisher Center and the professional program. And um, in order to shake things up a bit, uh, we started a new program called Live Arts Board, which is a residency and commissioning program. And the idea is that um, artists um, come and join the community, sometimes for quite a short period of time and sometimes for a very long period. We did a, with Sarah Mitchelson, um, Sarah had a four year residency with us um, uh, and made a project with students and then also with professional performers over the course of four years. Um, and uh, that in a way we're all, um, you know, we're cohabiting a space, we're breaking bread together. Um, and um, it's interesting because in, in our conversations with um, our students at the moment, they're really um, holding us accountable to that idea and saying, you know, we need to rededicate ourselves to that founding idea. And I'm so grateful for it because the, the great danger is after a, a number of years of any kind of structure um, that you become institutionalized. And um, the, the, uh, the opportunity in working with artists or students is not to calcify, never to think I'm gonna do the same thing that I did last year but to constantly try and um, be led by um, what is urgent and exciting and complex and new. Um, and that has to be, there has to be, I think a creative dynamic between, um, uh, between the academy and the professional performing arts. It's the, it has to be the future of the arts in this country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I do think that perhaps the BART model or the model of the ART before and even in a different structure or other is, you know, the closest perhaps to kind of a European idea of a theater, you know, that is in a way a non-profit, but it's about thinking, about research, about experimentation, where you uh, rework uh, perhaps psychological family situation, but also problems in society that you, um, you know, everything gets reflected of what is, uh, what is happening in, in, in the moment of what might be happening that it is um, anticipated. And uh, that is why it's so significant uh, the work um, of, of Bard or what you are doing, that it is really a model. And if it could happen there, it can help and also somewhere else. And so many of American universities, I might be misinterpreting it, but they are looking to Broadway and to that highly commercial theater that success is, you know, who made it in that, you know, um, that form, which of course has this, uh, is a beautiful one and an important one, but um, also with its limitations. You know, we don't want bookstores where you only see the bestsellers on that small shelf and you buy them. We want to have a gigantic bookstore and, um, and there needs to be a lot of books like these to even write one of them, these bestsellers. So the universities uh, should play a role and they should be supported. Perhaps it is, as you say, a model like museums that they are caretakers of a theater that has a global perspective, a political, clear political idea, and um, also attest, uh, aesthetic values that are not uh, uh, dominated or uh, influenced by, will it be successful? Will people love Will people buy the shows, tickets that are now getting also very, very expensive at nonprofits? So um, uh, Gideon, we, we changed a bit, as I said, from talking um, with artists, artists, because we feel this is a time now and anybody who watched the debates and everything, we are in deep concern about this country where it goes. Das theater has to rethink what it is doing. And we had Baraka Sele here yesterday, unfortunately she, her camera didn't work on the computer and the photo we put on to see her somehow didn't translate it. So, 
was uh, her voice and people looking at me and said, what is this guy there doing? But she talked about, you know, about uh, uh, the, the state also of, of, of black artists and uh, Black Lives Matter and for decades what she has been talking about and people were really I was a bit annoyed of hearing it. Um, did something change for you? Or is there a different listening? Do you what are you doing that is different before? Or what should theater do that's different from your as your from your perspective? Uh, it's a it's a uh, also a great question. Um, I mean, I can't speak in generalities about uh, theatre. Oh, I think Tanya is about to join us. Perfect timing, because uh, Tanya is going to change everything. Um, uh, I uh, hi Tanya. Hi there. I don't. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Uh, maybe let's give you an answer, and then we we will weave you into the conversation. Yeah. Uh, so Tanya Frank just asked me a question about how I think theatre should change. Um, I mean, I, it's a it's a it's a huge question. I um, uh, I really think that the opportunity we're being given at the moment by this universal shutdown is to go back to our core values, whatever those values are. For you know, and the answer will be different for different artists and different institutions. But business as usual is no way to work. If we're not, you know, picking up every situation and looking at it and thinking, you know, how can this function um, for now in this current moment, then I don't think, if we're not doing that, then we're not doing our job. And I, um, I can only speak for myself and say, I am so glad I, at the moment, you know, I'm not responsible for an institution where I have to run a season where I feel that I have six slots that I have to fill, where I have to raise a certain amount of money, which is the same every year to sell a certain number of seats and so on, so that the business is leading. No, no, I think the art has to lead. And the, and the opportunity at the moment is to put the artist back where they belong in the center of the process. And um, if we really do that and pay attention, then we're gonna learn how we need to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in a way we have a, a Tanya with us and uh, who is an artist you brought in actually something you you talked about uh, Tanya Crow is a live artist creating installations and performances focused on audience interactivity and its politics. She's based in Beirut in Lebanon and which is such a complicated place at the moment where everything is also crystal clear next to Corona. We just had a Sahar. Uh, Dima uh, on, on last week uh, giving us an update from there. But uh, Tanya, she's a distinguished artist in residence of theater and performance and co-director of an MA in human rights and the arts at Bard College. And I think this is something to really uh, talk about. And uh, she has presented in multiple languages across the world. She's a Soros art fellow, someone who was condemned by the Hungarian government. We just had the Hungarian school, the great Budapest school with us, which is being closed down basically after 150 years of a government institution um, is going to be privatized and, uh, and uh, people from a party will be put in charge uh, of the school as if the Republican would say, you know, I closed down Juilliard, a working model. They had three Oscar nomination student films in a row, one, one, but uh, they are um, in deep, deep trouble. Four weeks of student uh, um, occupation actually at the moment. Um, but um, she has been um, uh, with uh, uh, many, many uh, different uh, places. She got the Bessie Award, the International Life Arts Prize, Total Theater Innovation Award, and the Arches Brick Award. So she has a PhD in performance studies uh, from London, the Royal Holloway University, and she is co-founder of the Dictaphone Group Research and Performance Collective. Tanya, um, so how does it feel to be uh, brought in as an artist in a structure like the one Gideon is moving in? Hi, first, Hi. thank you for having me. <laughs> and uh, sorry I was late. Um, how does it feel? I think you should ask me in a couple of years. Um, we just started, I don't know, we've done our, um, the festival last year that we co-curated. It was such a privilege for me to actually be, yeah, it, 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 the 
festival, um, Gideon invited me to co-create it uh, with him. It's, it was a, a multidisciplinary festival that took over Fisher Center at Bard, happened in various places, encounters that are not necessarily traditional in the way they invite the audience in. And uh, they all focus, uh, all of these commissions, because they were all new pieces, they focused on the uh, uh, idea of borders. Um, and how people engage with the idea of borders, whether it's national borders, borders within the body, borders between people, uh, uh, archiving the borders, various ways in how we engage politically and socially with the idea of borders. And it was, for me, it was such a, a privilege, uh, first because I had to also create work and then situate my work, see it, um, conversing with other people, other artists, artists that I care about and I find inspiring. Um, and just uh, to, it was extra um, special and exciting for me because I usually just see my work come to life. And now I've seen my work, but also other works come to life next to each other and how they related and spoke with each other. Um, but for the other type of work and creating this MA and uh, working with an institution, I'm very excited about you. You'll have to ask me in three years. <laughs> I'll, I'll be more honest then. We could maybe just talk a little bit about how it, how, I mean, how this crazy idea happened. Yeah. Um, I have so, never an MA in human rights and the arts. Well, it, I, I mean, it hasn't started yet, Frank. You're hearing it from us for the first time. <laughs> Does it it's, exist it's, anymore? It's about to exist. But it's, it's, it's a complete not something yet. New. Sorry? It's something completely new. It's something completely new. Well, yeah, yeah, it's something completely new, but it comes out of the work that Tanya and I were doing on the festival last year. So um, in, 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 you know, 30 seconds, um, I guess in my first or second year at Bard, um, I had been asked by Johanna Burton, who was then the head of the graduate school uh, in curatorial studies at Bard, if I would work with her on an exhibition about performance uh, in museums. And she'd raised a grant um, to do an exhibition about performance in the galleries at the Contemporary Art Museum, the Hessel Museum at Bard. And we started uh, talking with artists and commissioning them. And then she uh, uh, left Bard to go to the new school and uh, sorry, to the new museum. And um, the grant went with her. So suddenly we were in a situation where we had a bunch of artists that we started commissioning to do work in galleries and uh, the money had gone and the galleries had gone because Johanna had gone. So, um, so Caleb and I looked at each other and said, what are we gonna do? You know, we have all of this work that is um, exploring the relationship between the performing and visual arts, and we don't have a place to do it. And we could do it in the Performing Arts Center, but that doesn't make sense because this is not work for theaters. And then out of desperation, we thought, well, what if we do this utopian thing of pretending that the Performing Arts Center is actually a museum and we borrow the infrastructure of a museum, we build galleries in unconventional spaces, um, uh, we you know, open up, we turn black boxes into white cubes, and we ask the audience, the public, to interact in a completely different way with the building. And we'll see what happens. Um, and it was amazing, I gotta say. And it came out of necessity. It was not our plan. The building showed us how to use it. And it came alive in completely new ways. And halfway through that first um, ex performance exhibition that we called The House is Open, we decided we would do another one in two years' time. And um, in two years time, Trump had just been elected and um, this coincided with a, a performance exhibition we did on the subject of surveillance. And we commissioned a number of artists, um, uh, uh, including Will Rawls and um, Annie Dawson, um, Alex Segaday and so on, to make work thinking about surveillance. And then we wanted to do another one. And um, Tanya and I had just met at the Under the Radar Festival where I'd seen her incredible piece garden speak. Uh, and I asked her whether she would have any interest in working on this uh, festival. And we worked together. And then we took, a, we took a road trip, Tanya and I, up to Dartmouth. 
to do a studio visit for Emily Jasser, um, Palestinian filmmaker, whose work we wanted to include in the Borders Festival. And on the way up and on the way down from Dartmouth on a very snowy February couple of days, we started dreaming about uh, ways to get Tanya to stay at Bard. And um, Tanya said, how about an MA program? And we went back and started talking with colleagues of ours at Bard. And it so happened that, and we didn't know this at the time, that Bard was becoming the lead partner on uh, a huge international network called the Open Society University Network, which George Soros um, was about to launch with a billion dollar gift. So this is a consortium of many international institutions um, all working together to imagine new forms of education, particularly education in areas of the world where there is very little higher education. And we were invited to make a proposal um, with um, two colleagues of ours, Tom Keenan, who heads the Human Rights Program at Bard, and uh, Ziad Abourish, who's a, a historian, Jordanian historian, who also happens to be um, Tanya's husband. Um, we were invited to make a proposal to start a new program. And so we, uh, out of the work that happened on the Borders Festival, uh, Tanya and Ziad and Tom and I began to dream of a new way of bringing artists and activists together in a, in a global context to find new ways of working. Why is like that all important? these, why is that what? Why is that important? Why do you think? Tanya. Uh, I mean, I guess we're gonna find that soon. <laughs> uh, there are different ways, I mean, uh, there are different ways to think about the intersection of art and politics. Artists have been um, using tools of activism for a long time, and activists have been using creative work, creative tools for a very long time. There is a very clear intersection in many work, in many of the works of artists that we enjoy, and the work that I personally do. Um, so I think it's a, it's an area that needs needs to be studied more um, and to um, just I think it's very exciting to put these um, uh, disciplines together uh, and see what happens see uh, what will it be like to have artists studying on the same course with people who work in activism others who are just critics um, and see how they can learn from each other how they can uh, interact um, I personally, as an artist, find it the most exciting when I collaborate with uh, people who are from very different disciplines. Uh, for example, urban researchers, architects, historians. Um, I find that um, exciting, but also very enriching. Um, and I personally, and I think a lot of us probably share that, I'm sure uh, Gideon too has talked about that. We're interested in art that doesn't just have a political stand, that doesn't just say I am with uh, the right uh, of movement. Uh, I am anti-discrimination of people just because of their colors or where, where they come from. Uh, but we're interested in work that actually adds to the conversation, work that function as a knowledge production, that function as almost like info activism, that uh, adds something to the conversation and that, that we can build on. All of us, uh, activists, journalists, uh, scholars can build on that work and use it sometimes as a historical uh, object, sometimes as evidence. You know, we've seen a lot of work recently in the last, decade that provided evidence, artists that actually dig into uh, certain um, events, contested events, contested spaces, and provide evidence that we can all learn from and build uh, um, on. I would also say, um, you know, and, and, and we'll see how this evolves as the program develops, but, you know, Frank, you're asking questions about how 2020 is changing things for us. And I suspect that, you know, one thing that's gonna happen is that there's gonna be, there already has been a huge shakeup in the way that um, 
live art, performance, theatre, um, are produced, funded, toured, and so on. And for all kinds of reasons, I suspect that the infrastructures that you know Tanya and I grew up with are over. Um, the, the, the major festivals, I mean, you know, major festivals are probably over. Um, they're expensive. They're environmentally catastrophic. Um, there's a there's a tendency to globalization, which was very exciting in the 90s um, and now um, has created a kind of homogeneity. So it doesn't really matter which city you're in, the festival looks the same. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I, my, I suspect that this, this form of production and of touring is unsustainable now. Um, and that um, a lot of the artists that we're interested in, and you know, Tanya I think is a great example of this, um, for, for Tanya, the, 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 the production infrastructure, the way that the work is made and toured is built into the artistic project itself. It's very self-sufficient and it's therefore nimble and responsive um, and, uh, and yet has a very, very deep um, emotional impact, cultural impact on uh, the people who participate with it. Um, and so I think that part of what we're going to be exploring is how to help artists to see the development of infrastructure as an integral part of the way that they're working. Because I don't think we can rely on systems of touring and production that we have been used to before. 2020 is just wiping all of that out. And that's not necessarily, I mean, it's, it's, it's enormously hard for many, many, many millions of people in the cultural sector. But in the long run, it may actually be a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. So in a way, uh, joining the ecological movement of local products um, of uh, uh, building, joining, reinforcing uh, communities uh, interaction with the audience, you know, the people on the market and it's something that they are already always had as part of it, but perhaps, as you said, you know, in these kind of a, uh, um, global reach of festivals where it is, as you said, was hard to know, you know, which festival uh, it really is it, they, you know, um, um, do copies sometimes, you know, of, uh, of existing artists who then toured and, um, and, and, um, and perhaps uh, did not fully engage. We had a Jean-Luc Nancy, the French philosopher also with us, who I talked about earlier, who said, you know, he didn't like this idea of, of tourism, you know, that I was like ghetto tourism, I would say, where you fly in a resort and then you fly out, but you don't learn anything, you don't connect uh, to a community. And theater companies who tour here go back because they never then were able fully to connect or have an impact. And, um, and yeah, so, the, and I think there is and should have course be a place that we see theater from around the world and globally like musicians listen to global music to do their own music but I think what everybody talked about in those four months when we talked five days to everybody said yes it has to be smaller it has to be more local we have to listen we have to look in the eyes of the people who are our audiences it has to make a difference and it's great if they see us the next day the next month the next year and they know who we are. So um, it is a, 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 a big change. But I like the idea very, very much to say the human kind of the human rights, you know, to connect to it. Access to the arts, like access to education and to healthcare is a human right in a way anyway. But also that it is very clear that the arts are on the on the side of the, the struggle for freedom and for sort of speech freedom of uh, liberty. And uh, so will you um, then uh, invite uh, 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 artists to be on staff. Will they come for a semester and then they go? Or will you use existing uh, 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 teach to model people who teach in different departments of, of the college? Well, how is this going to look like? Will there be productions, uh, uh, audiences invited? What is going to happen? Uh, first, can you hear me? Because my internet yeah. is a little mm -hmm. bit cracking. You, 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 you I have to put the video uh, off to, to be able mm -hmm. to hear you. Um, 
uh, we are still very early uh, on in actually conceptualizing that we there will definitely be a, a part of it that it's uh, uh, public. Uh, whether it will be part of the program or a side project that uses the same uh, uh, people and staff, we're uh, trying to figure that um, out. We would like to continue doing the, these festivals that take over the Fisher Center and um, uh, it, like engage with one theme. Um, and then uh, um, uh, we will definitely invite artists whether as guest uh, lecturers, but also to join. There will be some new people who will uh, join uh, the faculty for sure. And we're also hoping that ultimately the program will have an international component too. So that, um, I mean, one thing that Tanya and I were hoping to do on the Borders Festival um, was to have chapters uh, in other cities as well. So that we were we were imagining a festival that could sort of touch down in um, in Berlin, where Bard has a college. Um, actually, also in the West Bank, where Bard has a college. Um, uh, and now with Osun, um, you know, this is really a worldwide network mm. of existing institutions, and then also. Um, you know, institutions that, 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 that don't really exist inside a, a formal structure. Um, so th there is an invitation to, I mean, it really is a, um, uh, it's an invitation to imagine a new, uh, a new form of education and of, uh, of art making. What we do know is it'll be a small cohort of students. Uh, there'll be artists and there'll be activists and human rights scholars working together over the course of two years. Um, and uh, there will be uh, a mixture of existing BARD faculty uh, from different disciplines teaching. And then also uh, some visiting artists and activists as well, um, who will invite to join for a short term or a long term. But you know, again, like everything else, um, I hope it doesn't become too um, predictable or too institutionalized because it needs to stay responsive to what's happening in the world. So the, the process that we're, on, that we're engaged in at the moment, um, uh, Tanya and Ziad in Beirut and, and Tom and me and our colleagues um, in Annandale and Hudson, um, is to imagine a structure that will allow us to be open. Um, and it's also very important that this, to us, that this is, you know, this is not an expensive program to participate in, that the barrier to access is, very low, so it's not going to fall into the the American MFA, you know, cash cow trap, which makes it so difficult for artists to to be able to work. Um, but uh, <clears throat> perhaps our more academic colleagues will, you know, shudder if I say this. But I think we are, in a way, building this as a it's, as an art project, as an extension of Tanya's artistic practice um, as well. So it it will have the the innovation and the flexibility um, that uh, that uh, um, that an artistic project does as well. Yeah, how, how, how is that fair, it? Tanya? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We're gonna work on a website that will uh, have all these information and all of the call out for students and for people to join us. Um, so. Um, Watch the space. <laughs> <laughs> no, how, how inspiring to think that uh, there's such hybrid forms can exist that uh, an MA program at a respected university, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, can be an extension of an artistic uh, practice of an artist that was at the moment still in, in, in Beirut, that uh, there is interest from different disciplines to connect to the arts and use the format as a way of reflecting, of thinking, looking at work on a stage or in a space as a way of thinking a philosophical uh, reflection and uh, I think it was also Bright said that perhaps it will be philosophy you know that it will be the, the theater of a 21st century and we understand things through movements and lights and objects like in Japanese uh, tradition you know the way a meal is presented or how objects are created you know 
eat itself off philosophers and statements. And, um, and it is uh, really stunning. And I want to everybody who listen really to point out how radically different such approaches compare to, yes, let's do a directing program and someone comes in and teaches the students how to do 42nd Street that maybe one day could be on Broadway and they could dance in it or they could direct the revival of it, you know, which is a big, would be the big success story. And this is, cannot be more different. And it is a, such a significant contemporary and I think also much needed um, um, piece of a mosaic where a theater in the 21st century will go as a political, but also as an aesthetic uh, practice. Coming to the aesthetics, what, what do you look for? What do you, when do you say Gideon, but maybe then also you, um, uh, what what defines the aesthetic that you say this is significant uh, if, you, if you can answer that at all you know or perhaps name some artists where you feel this is what we are talking about I, you know I think it's not I don't think it's conscious I don't think I have an aesthetic um, I will say that when I meet someone that I really want to work with that uh, I, I get a feeling <laughs> in my chest and in, I mean, maybe it's in my heart. Um, that, and that the people that uh, we tend to work with at the Fisher Center, we develop long-term relationships with. Um, I mean, this certainly happened with Tanya. You know, Tanya and I had breakfast the morning after she gave a talk at the public um, theater during Under the Radar, God, four years ago, I guess, something like that. Um, when they presented, when Mark Russell presented Garden Speak. And by the end of the breakfast, it was like, you know, um, you know, a love affair has started. Uh, I mean, not in a not in a not in a literal way, but in a you know, here is somebody that I would really like to, um, you know, be deeply connected with, who who is going to open up new ways of thinking and being. Um, I mean, my uh, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much time with this, but the, for me, the kind of you know, the most significant example other than Tanya at the moment is. Um, a relationship now with, with Pam Tanowitz, the choreographer, um, who uh, is now the resident choreographer at the Fisher Center. And we, you know, we're creating many, many works with her. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a crazy thing. She, she, we presented some work of hers um, at the Fisher Center in 2015. We very rarely just present, we're not a presenting organization, but, but that summer, because it was the summer that we were first doing Daniel Fish's Oklahoma, um, we didn't have the bandwidth to commission new dance at the same time. So we presented some existing work of Pam's and it was amazing. And I had breakfast with her the next morning and we were talking at a cafe in the Hudson Valley. Um, and I was just amazed by the complexity and beauty of what I'd seen the night before. And I asked her um, if she could tell me about, one of the pieces had a very strange title. There is a point to this story. Um, the, the title was um, A Broken Story Wherein There Is No Ecstasy. And I said, this is such a beautiful title. Can you tell me about it? And she said, well, um, A Broken Story is part of a J.D. Salinger short story title. And Wherein There Is No Ecstasy is a line from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. And I said, I love four quartets. And she said, I love four quartets. And we started talking about it. And by the end of that meal, I said, you know, this is a crazy idea, but what if we commission you to make a dance based on four quartets? And three years later, it happened. But I mean, it was really a three year journey to make that work. And when it works well, I would say we're all, you know, my colleagues, the artist, and ultimately the invitation is to the audience too, taking a leap into, um, it's such a cliche, but like a leap into the unknown. We had no idea where this was gonna take us. It was literally the beginning of a journey. And it was as if we took each other by the hand and said, let's go on this journey together. So it's not about aesthetics, but it is about bravery. It's about courage. Um, and I am really interested in supporting artists who are courageous because I think courage is what we need in the world at the moment. You know, under any, whether we're talking about a major proscenium dance work or whether we're talking about, 
a very small interactive performance for, for 10 people, um, or whether we're talking about a one-on-one -on -one online experience, doesn't matter. But it's about, it's about an invitation to a new way of seeing. Um, and that, that makes me very, that makes it worth, uh, you know, living for me. Tanya, some. Uh, that's nice, actually. It's so lovely to hear you talk about that, uh, Gideon. I mean, I knew that and I've noticed that uh, you, um, uh, you tend to kind of um, encourage a work that doesn't necessarily, um, so it's, it's, they're not very similar. So people, you'd, you'd li you like working and you encourage and you present work that are different in terms of forms, uh, but they have some similarity, I guess, in how the artists in engage and what they um, represent. Um, I would add to that, that I uh, too uh, tend to be inspired by uh, artists and artwork that is innovative. Um, so that is not predictable uh, in terms of the form, in terms of how um, they even engage with a certain content. Um, I've spoken before about uh, art that, it's, uh, that functions as knowledge production, art that um, actually takes itself seriously as a research engine, um, whether it's in the form or the content. So it's not just a, a work that disseminates certain ideas, but actually is an engine to uh, discuss these ideas, to put them out in the world, to uh, allow or in, uh, create a space where people can be transformed, truly deeply transformed. Uh, politically or opening up uh, emotionally um, I'm yeah I'm inspired by that and I try to uh, practice it as well yeah. I would just add to that and say you know that I think that the the experience that we're both talking about is um, uh, you know simply put I think if an, if an artist is doing something for the if, the if an artist is exploring something for the first time or is in some way reaching for something that they don't know how to do, then that sense of trying is also going to communicate to the audience. Whereas if what we're doing is simply trying to repeat what we've done before, nobody's going to be awake. Mm. I mean, no one's interested in that. Mm. And, uh, you know, so, and I, again, I, I just, you know, my wish, I guess, for 2020, <laughs> is that we take this as a serious invitation just not to do things the way we know how to do things. Mm. That, that, and that, that's gonna start shaking things up. Um, and I do think that we have a necessity right now <laughs> to make work, that we can't look at you know, Black Lives Matter and the American election and the global pandemic and say, well, this is a good time not to be creating art. You know, I really, <laughs> if not now, when? Mm. Yeah, that is true. And I like how you're connected to knowledge. Um, two of our students, Armia Frajoun from Israel um, and Corey Tamler, they created the Performing Knowledge uh, a project, which we did for a couple of years, where they invited students from all the 30 different disciplines, what they work on, uh, what they research. They're not performers. They are not, uh, you know, trained uh, in the... Uh, in theater or anything, and they let's perform your research. I mean, you know, we hosted days of, uh, you know, 20 sessions or 15, you know, where there was drama told by students, and the idea to perform, it might be an idea to, to, to invite them to, to perform knowledge, and also to see theater as a performance, as you said, of knowledge, or you used a different word. I think this is something that is a way or a new way of, 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 of looking at things, and your program for sure will be they are on the forefront and will be of interest. Um, you talked about getting on the Black Mountain uh, uh, and, uh, and the Bauhaus. Bauhaus was in Dessau, Black Mountain was, yeah, in the Black Mountains, um, Bard is in Bard. Not really sure how you convince Soros to say it's uh, uh, the region with no, with very little access to education, you know, but uh, uh, he, he might have uh, looked around it. But, do you have to be outside the centers, outside the metropolis? Uh, Stacy Klein's work, uh, the work of uh, 
um, of so many of the sea, whether we heard from Indonesia or Sri Lanka, where everybody talked about, you know, go outside, do a start, uh, uh, start uh, a small in a different way. Is that something also that perhaps comes out of this lesson? It doesn't have to happen in the centers which something like your place can flourish that is, um, yeah. I think it's a good question. I, I mean, I certainly think it's easier, it's easier to make work outside New York City. I mean, it's, but that may change now. I just, I can't say, because we don't know what New York is now. I mean, it's so different now, you know, maybe it's about to become the best time to make work in New York, I don't know. I mean, we did, when we ran Crossing the Line, um, Lily Chopra, Simon Dove and I, you know, um, I think we made pretty good things in the city too, but it was always, you know, the, we were very aware of the obstacles. And I think as long as you're, as long as you're aware of the obstacles, as long as you can see what makes something difficult and therefore creatively interesting, you can be anywhere. I mean, Tanya's made work in um, the center of major metropolises, but also on, you know, um, the island of Malta or on the coast of Lebanon. Tanya, I don't know whether you think it, it makes all that much difference. Uh, I agree that this is uh, about to change. Uh, it's been happening for quite a while where there's a sort of exodus from uh, artists from big cities because they simply can no longer afford to live there. Um, but I think with the climate change and with different pan uh, with the pandemic happening now and the threat of more pandemics uh, that might happen, uh, people are starting to think a little bit about um, a different uh, life, perhaps a healthier life, uh, a slower life, um, a space where you can uh, just focus on work without having to rush to be able to pay rent in a major city. Uh, I think there will be uh, uh, an effect on how we've been using the internet uh, to uh, disseminate work and to perform. Um, so I guess some of that will continue to happen and will make people feel that they can basically live anywhere. Um, I'm starting to think that uh, we should think uh, site specifically a little bit more. Um, I've done a lot of work um, uh, as site-specific performances um, and I uh, found myself now with the pandemic missing that more than the more uh, like a globe trotting from a festival to another just showing uh, the same work again but I found myself now with the pandemic missing that deeper engagement uh, with the space with certain communities who inhabit those spaces um, and make a, a, a longer and deeper um, research and uh, artwork. Uh, and I suspect that more of that will uh, start to happen. So I'd say that, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of artists have found uh, places a little bit more rural or um, outside of the major cities. Hmm. So Gideon, if you could, uh, I mean, we're coming closer to, 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 the, to, the, to the end of the conversation, but what, what if you, you know, would have, there were more George Soros's of the world and, and other things, what would you, what would you do? What, how would you turn bark? Which by the way, also you said, we reconfigured the building. It's a spectacular building in itself, you know, your, your, your place. It's so, um, so, so amazing. But what would you do? What do you feel? Um, is still missing. What would be uh, your your dream? What what you would do if you had, or both of you, you know, if you could really have an open an open suitcase with gold coins like Pippi Longstockings, you know, what would what would be the work you feel that's essential, that's important, that's what I would do. Now I don't think I can really answer that question because I can't separate. Um, I can't, I, it's, it's very hard for me to fantasize about the future. I mean, you know, I, I, although I'm not from the States, I've grown up in the States in, mm -hmm. um, uh, in a situation where we really have to raise the money in order to, I now see fundraising 
developing resources as completely integral to um, producing a project. So, you know, we often say at the Fisher Center that the question is not what are we making, but it's what are we making and how are we making it? And so the, 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 the limits of, you know, a budget or um, of a development plan are part of the structure of a creative process. So I couldn't say, you know, if I had $2 billion, what's the program that I would make? Because the not knowing where the money is going to come from um, is part of the excitement now of making the work. So actually, limitless resources is not an interesting or useful proposition for me. I mean, it's great to have support. I'm enormously grateful to, you know, um, to, to our patrons um, who make it possible for us to take these kinds of risks. But, um, you know, the president of Bard, Leon Botstein, often says that, um, you know, our poverty is um, not such a bad thing. And I, I it's easy to say that, uh, and uh, I am not underplaying my gratitude for what we have, but I think there's a danger in having too much. That really didn't answer your question. No, 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 it's, it, it is true, of course. No, I think it, <laughs> uh, no, I think you did well, and uh, I agree with you, and uh, working with obstruction is often pushes you to be um, innovative and to think outside the box and i i wouldn't really um think that what we need to create differently or think differently is uh what you call it like a big uh, larger box of uh, gold or however you you put it i think we just need to simply uh, uh create a more accessible more diverse uh, more sustainable uh art uh, industry and the art world um, and uh, we could do that without even a lot of um, money and uh, also we should remember that if we really want to be part of uh, thinking and reimagining a more just uh, uh, reality or political reality we need to think about art policies and we need to think that art should be supported and that people paying taxes should go into art that inspired them, uh, not only going into the uh, military, you know, for example. Um, and uh, so we, we have to rethink also what we rely on, uh, uh, that we uh, shouldn't just imagine and rely on public funding, uh, private funding. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, you know, the, two, um, the two huge challenges for us, as Tanya says, um, in, uh, in our field are finding ways to create points of access and interest for people who are not currently um, either able to come or interested in coming um, or engaging with work, for sure. Um, and the other is just that, uh, um, as I said, as we both said earlier, you know, the model at the moment is an environmental catastrophe and we can't continue to be part of the problem. I mean, wonderful though it is to, be, to build a big production and take it to 15 cities for two performances at a time, um, this is not healing the planet. And we have to be smarter about the way that we are um, developing networks that can um, engage with artists that don't involve everybody getting on an airplane and shipping us out. Yeah, yeah, no, I think these are absolutely the right, <clears throat> and the right, the right uh, uh, answers. And as Bryce said, you build the house with the stones you have. And uh, just to be able to work and change an institution you are in is tremendous. We had Thomas Oberender from the Berlin Festspiele who did a project with uh, Frédéric Atuitui and uh, Bruno Latour about climate change, where they feel this is the big theme. And they said, we would like to take off the air conditioning. How can you have air conditioning 
in a gigantic building in Berlin, but you want to talk about climate change. And he said, just to solve that and to document, you know, in itself, you know, is, is something, is, first of all, that you can do it, but how complex that it really is. And also that, as you said earlier, you know, that the way you produce, the way you put projects together, the way you collaborate has to be integral to the artistic and aesthetic, you know, uh, messages you are sending. It has to be honest, radically honest, and it has to be rethought, you know, that uh, Rene Polish, the Berlin director who says, I uh, write the words of my plays with the actors. Uh, I don't distribute them to main actors. Um, uh, they choose because uh, otherwise there is that system of hierarchy of stars and other. And if I do this in my work, what am I doing different than the people I criticize so harshly in my work when it comes, you know, to, 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 to the failings of that kind of neo-capitalism in Berlin that has, <clears throat> already or it's you know destroyed a lot what made the city um so great or endangered it so uh, i think um, this is a uh, 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 of real um, importance and what you what you do out there and we all of course have been there people will go people should go and also universities should look at it and also theaters you know what what does it mean to really engage with communities with knowledge uh, with the big themes of our time, how can we combine the human rights and the arts and, and many, many other things that are possible. You know, this is just one uh, combination that you have and it's exciting, it's inspiring. Um, we are proud of uh, what you do, you're part of our community and that you are exploring this as uh, test pilots in the sky and we hope the airplanes will hold and, uh, and the motors will, uh, will run and uh, maybe even get to outer space uh, once in a while. Um, Gideon is a, uh, and goes to you too, uh, Tanya, but what's up at Bard College? Is there, you know, you mentioned that Peter Sellersing has a closing thing. Tell us a bit what's, uh, what's, what's cooking uh, in the, uh, in the Absolutely. of the stove. And, um, well, how- right now, right now we're working with um, Charlotte Brathwaite, incredible director on two projects. Um, one is a, a collaboration with Michelle and Deggie Cello. Um, singer songwriter um which is a a, 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 in the deepest sense a tribute to to james baldwin um uh which is taking uh which has many outputs um they're making some digital work some animations uh michelle has recorded some songs um but also they're distributing broadsheets uh newspapers um and uh, there's a phone line where members of the public can call in um and uh, uh, it's a it's a very very beautiful project that doesn't have one culminating performance, but it's going to be spread out over many months. Um, and then um, Charlotte uh, is also working with um, uh, a, a team of collaborators uh, across disciplines on a, a a project called The Future Is Present, um, which he's making in part with our students at Bard. Um, which um, grew out of a project she's been doing for several years called Casting the Vote, which has been looking at uh, patterns of voter suppression and systemic racism in the US. Um, And this particular version of it is very much about um, amplifying the voice of uh, black teenagers um, and uh, really using the dreams of black youth um, as the those dreams become the authors of a series of artistic projects. And we don't know what those are gonna be yet, uh, but they're gonna be developed over the next um, eight or nine weeks. Um, And then there'll be a further iteration into the next year. So it's very, um, um, it's intense, beautiful, radical work. It's completely non-hierarchical. In fact, it's a kind of inverted triangle where, um, you know, the, the, uh, the people who are normally really disenfranchised are going to be calling the shots in the project, um, and it's um, it's magnificent. Um, then we have a, 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 a number of other projects uh, that we're working on with Pan Tanowitz, um, and uh, uh, we're working with Daniel Fish on another project, which will um, be in the festival next summer in whatever form it can take. Of course, we have no idea whether we can be in the building or not, and we're now thinking about. I mean, something I'm. Um, working on a lot with our um, with my colleagues at the Fisher Center is um, how we can produce in a state of not knowing what the what the outcome is going to be and also how we can use the challenge of um, 
reaching audiences in uh, places where we are not as a as a as a creative um, advantage. So I think there'll be much more on that soon. I have a feeling that the, the you know, although I completely agree with Tanya that you know the internet is here to stay as a as a creative tool. We're not going to want to be staring into laptops by ourselves for too too much longer. Mm -hmm. um, and there may be new um, new ways of creating and new ways of experiencing work collectively. Um, out there waiting to be discovered. Tanya, what, what next to preparing for the MA program? Are you working? Um, on yeah, so I uh, am supposed to be uh, touring. I was supposed to be touring uh, my work uh, all this year, but um, some of it is going uh, uh, online, others are just kind of postponed. Um, so um, I should be showing work with Under the Radar and uh, uh, Bard as well, pa partnering with Bard early January. And then uh, we will continue to uh, work on the uh, MA program and uh, uh, the uh, other uh, public programs next to it. Um, and hopefully we'll uh, launch all of that next year. Fantastic. But as, as Gideon said, I mean, it's all, uh, it's very interesting to be creating or thinking about the future now and everything is a little bit uh, shifting and we don't know how the future will be. Yeah, that's true. as Mer Meredith Monk said here on the talk, don't be afraid of the unknown, you know, so, but it is, it is unknown. What we'll do, last tips, what are you reading or listening to or view any tips from books, music, movie, something, what? People should focus. Uh, uh, I've been, um, uh, this sounds very grim. I've been reading, my, my dad passed away over the summer and I've been reading a lot of books about um, mortality and the end of life. Um, so particularly, I just read Atul Kawanda's incredible book, Being Mortal, and uh, a beautiful work by a, um, a Zen palliative care nurse from Oregon called Sally Tisdale. And the book is called Advice for Future Corpses and Those Who Love Them. And it was enormously helpful to me in, uh, in, in my dad's final days, as has working on the Peter Sellers project been mm -hmm. as well, because it's, it's very, very connected. So yeah, that's, that's, my, that's been my reading recently. Tanya, you have some? Sorry, yeah, can you hear me? Um... Yeah, I've been actually uh, uh, mainly listening to uh, loads of things while on the move and uh, um, I've been really enjoying listening to these uh, radio projects that started with the pandemic. Um, I mean, I think this is a, um, a practice that started with a neighborhood radio that started in Italy. And then uh, a similar one uh, uh, happened in Beirut and another in Ramallah and another in Tunis. So I've been listening uh, to all of that. Uh, uh, some of them are just uh, people talking, rambling, uh, and uh, uh, some really good uh, music and DJing happening. So I've been uh, mainly tuning to that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is true. We listen much more careful than we did before and, um, and perhaps people also talk in a different way though. Thank you both really, really um, for taking uh, your time. And I hope, um, you know, you, it was as informative and meaningful, you know, as it was for us, it was really an insight into your minds, what you're doing, what you're planning, the open question. Thank you for being so honest. And I think it's really inspiring um, of what you are doing and, um, and we should all uh, watch and check out what, what is happening at that uh, Bard uh, College. Tomorrow we have uh, a little bit of the work of the Siegel Center I'm on a focus since 15 years. We do a festival called Prelude, where we present work in progress from New York artists and New York companies. It's exclusively actually New York artists and companies because we felt there is not so much left as a space where people develop work or do it for where people look and, and watch for David Broom and Miranda Heyman, the two curators that I work with, they put it really together. Um, they will be here talking a bit about the selection, the process, what it means to make a festival, which also now will be completely online and uh, 
there's like 15, 20 artists participating and uh, what we should look out for. It's still also very much in the progress, very much uh, unknown. Sammy is the producer and, uh, and many others are with it. We, will, we, we hope we will all get it together. It's gonna to be starting October 22nd, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then the following week. Uh, and we haven't announced it's a program. It's also work in progress, but we're always a little bit late, but it will also be interesting. And, um, and I hope um, we, um, we will also give a little home for some productions coming out of this great city that has a great energy. And New York has been through a lot over the centuries and the city will bounce back and it will be different. And we think perhaps also will have learned something that makes it an even better one in this because there were, as Gideon said, there were the big problems also here and things that perhaps, you know, were not, were not, were not right. So um, um, that's uh, an update from us. Thank you again uh, for joining. Thanks for Thank our listen, to, to listen um, and take time out of your daily life Ultimately, really, this is about you. What Gideon and Tanya talked about is to reach you, um, to put uh, uh, something out in the real life, in the real space. As Edouard Glissant, he said, the thoughts are not in your head. They are not imaginary. They are not in cyberspace. They're actually real. They're outside and they produce imagination and change something. So this is important what you think and that perhaps something in your life also gets inspired or changed or you're interested or do some research as Baraka said yesterday, where she said, you know, do your research, uh, read, uh, find out. It's not her job alone to let them know, you know, about about situation. I think your project that is so connected to knowledge and performing and the arts and the aesthetic and the political really uh, combines a lot of what is so needed. and. Um, it is uh, inspiring in one of many forms that should be out there and should be tried. These are ex also real and experiment. We want it from artists, but do institutions really do that? Do they really experiment? Do they really give a space to try something out? Where if could fail, where failure is okay? I think this will not, it's a fantastic idea, but it should be. And uh, you have to try out many things to find what works. And no director in this theater stage knows on the first day of rehearsal what he is doing, but everybody pretends, especially also at university, that you know everything and you just execute something. And then often actually it does not work. So the unknown doing by thinking and the thinking by doing is a recipe that we can transfer from artistic experiences, aesthetic experience into real life, wherever we are in any way we are in. It's actually a model that works that you regroup, you have an idea, you change, you go ahead, you regroup, change, and hopefully then you will arrive at something that will be working. Thank you all. Thanks for HowlRound uh, for hosting us. And um, and uh, uh, it's a big privilege for us to have you guys here knowing that you took it so seriously. Thank you for your really kind and generous words, uh, Gideon. It means a lot uh, to really us at the Eagle Center because we know you mean it. And it also stays with, you know, with your entire world. And it really congratulations everything you guys do. And also, as you said, Caleb, and who has been a great friend of our center and, uh, and so many, many other, and Tom, who also, you know, the partner who was a, a little curious. So there are many, many uh, connections, but uh, you do something. A lot of people talk and have ideas and do things, but doing something is complicated to have nests, to build nests uh, for ideas. and. Uh, and bring out something alive that's really complicated. And this is happening at your place. So thank you, and Tanya, one day, I hope we will meet. We showed some of your work also at one of our film festivals on Freedom Performance. Yeah, did. Surveillance thank people, you. I remember that in the cafes, that was great. And um, good luck and stay safe, uh, everybody vote and, uh, and stay tuned.